maestría y su doctorado en meteorología en el MIT. Después, él tiene publicados más de 370 artículos, dos de ellos 220 revisados por pares, y sus áreas de, de este, a las que está dedicado es a la geoingeniería, efectos climáticos debidos a una guerra nuclear o a erupciones volcánicas y al, sobre los suelos también cuando hay erupciones volcánicas. Él es editor de Review of Geophysics ¿sí? y él fue autor líder en 2013 del Working Group 1 para el reporte de asesoramiento intergubernamental del, plane, del panel climático, de cambio climático, que fue, o sea, recibió el premio Nobel en 2007. Recientemente, él sirve como miembro del de Board of Trustees de la cooperación de universidades para el, la investigación en atmósfera, y este opera en la NCAR, que es el National Center for Atmospheric Research. Y bueno, pues le agradecemos muchísimo. Él es fellow de la AGU, ¿sí? también ha venido en varias ocasiones a dar charlas a la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. ¿sí? Es miembro también de la Sociedad Americana de Meteorología y de la Asociación Americana para el avance de las ciencias y pues le agradecemos muchísimo que esté aquí, la charla va a ser en inglés, la vamos a filmar y posteriormente la pueden consultar en la página del Instituto de Geofísica. Denos un, una semana o un par de semanas. Gracias. Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, Uh, yo estudié español en la escuela secundaria, pero hace más de uh, seis, 50 años y no lo uso mucho y por eso voy a hablar en, es, en, en inglés, es, es más fácil para, para mí. Uh, I will start with an advertisement. Uh, I'm the editor of Reviews of Geophysics. It's the most highly cited journal in our field, so if anybody has something that you want to review, like maybe impacts of <laughs> asteroids yeah, and want to write a review article, that there's no, fi no page charges, it can be as long as you want, so please, please talk to me. Uh, I'm going to start talking about Sherry Rowland. Uh, you who are atmospheric scientists know who he was. He, along with Mario Molina, and Paul Crutzen won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their work on stratospheric uh, chemistry and understanding the ozone hole. He died in 2012, and in, in his obituary in EOS, he said, uh, is it enough for a scientist simply to publish a paper? Isn't it a responsibility of scientists if you believe that you have found something that can affect the environment. Isn't it your responsibility to actually do something about it, enough so that action actually takes place? If not us, who? If not now, when? So this is an uh, inspiration for me to work on, on this topic. People say, why are you working on this? And uh, because I think it's a danger to the world that we've discovered, and it's our obligation to talk about it. This work was done not just by me, but with my uh, colleagues, uh, Mike Mills, Ira Helfen, Brian Toon, Rich Turco, Gira Stenchikov, my current postdoc, Lily Xia, Ch Chuck Bardeen, Andrew Stenke, Luke Oma, my former student, and, and uh, Julie Ellie Taylor. Uh, Richard Turco and Brian Toon and Gira Stenchikov were some of the scientists in the 1980s who worked on nuclear winter, and so we've come back to it again. And, this idea of nuclear winter was also stimulated by Paul Crutzen, who pointed out in 1982 that if there was a nuclear war, there would be fires, and the fires would produce smoke. And the smoke would go up in the atmosphere, and maybe it could cause climate change, and that's when we started working on it. I published a, by the way, if anybody wants a copy of my presentation, I gave Dave the uh, link, he can give it to you. There's an, uh, 
another version, a recent version on my webpage. So we published a number of journal articles about this in the last 10 years. And so I don't want to. And so what I'm going to talk about comes from these articles in JGR, ACP, Climatic Change, Earth's Future, Science, Nature. Here's the story. This is our beautiful planet. But after a nuclear war, it might look like this, with smoke from the fires covering it, and then heated by the sun, it would go into the southern hemisphere. And th this is how it would work. There are two types of targets, ground bursts, which would be missile silos, or air bursts over cities and industrial areas. This would produce fires. And the firestorms would build and produce smoke. This would produce dust from the ground. In both cases, they would affect the sunlight. Sunlight would re be reflected, or sunlight would be absorbed. And in both cases, that means little sunlight would reach the ground. And that would cause rapid, large drops in surface temperature. And if there's enough smoke, there would be a large impact on temperature. And that, of course, would be devastation to global agriculture and ecosystems. And so if there was enough smoke, it would get so dark and cold that we would not be able to grow food. The smoke in the upper atmosphere and the stratosphere also absorbs sunlight and heats. And this then causes global ozone loss. It affects the, the ozone uh, reactions. And that would allow a lot more ultraviolet radiation to reach the surface. And that would also be devastating. So here's a, we had an article in Scientific American. Here's a drawing what it would look like. Uh, nuclear winter. Temperatures would be as cold as winter in the summertime. In, in Mexico, that's not as big a deal because you don't have as large of an annual range. But in higher latitudes, it would be below freezing in the summertime. And so it would be cold, dry, dark, more ultraviolet, and that would cause crops dying and global famine. This is a graph of the number of nuclear weapons on the planet. They were invented by the United States. Then Russia started building them. And the total was up to about 70,000 in the middle 1980s. And then the arms race ended, and the numbers started to come down. And because of the New START Treaty, by, the year, by next year, 5,000. This includes Russia and America, and there's seven, seven other countries that have them, and they have a very small number, so they're included in the total. The first paper on nuclear winter by Crutzen and Burks was published in 1982. The next year, there were papers by Russians, Alexandrov and Stenchikov, and by Americans, Turco et al., that both got the same result, that the smoke would cause global cooling. And then the next year, the, I published a paper uh, looking at the long-term effects. And then the arms race ended. The number of weapons started to go down. And I maintain that it was this science informed policy, and, and it changed the world. Now, some people say the arms race ended because the Soviet Union collapsed. But the Soviet Union didn't collapse until five years later. So that wasn't what caused it. When we do research in atmospheric science, we take observations, we run com computer models, and we analyze our theories. When you do research in history, it's different. In history, you just ask the people, what did you do? Why did you make that decision? And so to support my, my claim, uh, oh, by the way, this is still not zero. So the, the problem is not solved. Uh, we still have 5,000 nuclear weapons. You can ask the people that made the decision. Ronald Reagan, US president, he said, a great many reputable scientists, I guess he thought I was reputable, uh, are telling us that such a war could end up in no victory for anyone. We could wipe out the Earth as we know it. And if you think back to natural calamities, volcanic eruptions, we saw the weather so changed there was snow in July in many temperate countries. They call it the year in which there was no summer. Now, if one volcano can do that, what are we talking about with the nuclear exchange, the nuclear winter? It's possible. And the other person that made this decision to end the arms race was Mikhail Gorbachev. Models made by Russian and American scientists showed that a nuclear war would end in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. The knowledge of that was a great stimulus to us, people of honor morality, to act in that situation. 
So that was a, a long time ago, 34 years ago. Why am I even bringing it up now? I want to ask two questions. The Cold War is over. The nuclear arms race is over. Could the remaining nuclear arsenal still produce nuclear winter? Do we have enough weapons to produce enough smoke to make the temperature below freezing in the summertime? And the other question concerns, now there aren't just two countries with weapons, there are nine. What if two of these other countries with a small number of weapons had a nuclear war? What impact would that have? So I'm going to give you the answers. The answer is yes. We can still produce nuclear winter, and it would last longer than we thought before. And a smaller number of weapons would not produce a nuclear winter, that is, the temperatures would not get below freezing, but it would be a horrible catastrophe. Millions dead from the direct effects and severe impacts on agriculture for more than a decade. What does a nuclear weapon do? So this was one of the nuclear weapons tests when we were still testing in the atmosphere in, the, in Nevada. So these are the dignitaries. See, they have sunglasses on and pink fingers in their ears. And there, there was a blast several kilometers away. And this light is just from that blast. It was called the upshot knothole test. It's like bringing a piece of the sun to the surface of the Earth for a fraction of a second. And everything within a certain region uh, distance just bursts into flames. This was a test house they built. So you can see the house is lit up. You can see the shadow from the fireball. And as the fireball goes up, the shadow gets shorter. But then the house starts to burn. And then the blast wave hits, like thunder following lightning. It's sound waves rather than light waves. And it begins to blow it apart. And you might say, well, it's going to blow out the fire. But also, it's going to break the electrical lines. It's going to break the gas connections. And there will be many ways for fuel to burn. The question is, how did the camera survive? The camera was in a concrete bunker, uh, specially fortified, looking away from the blast. So they planned for that. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we have examples. So how do we know if th this is all theory I'm telling you about, about climate change. How do we test the theory? Scientists like to go into a laboratory. Uh, doctors like to test medicine on rats or on, on people. But we can't do that. We don't want to do this experiment in the real world. So we try and look at other things that have happened that inform us about parts of this theory. Unfortunately, in the first Gulf War, uh, where there were industrial targets burned, and they burned with this black city smoke. And it's this black smoke that causes the climate change. So it, when we were doing the research in the 1980s, we'd go into a room and say, OK, these, uh, there's no carpet here. Oh, there's carpet over there. That's probably made out of some plastic from oil. It burns with this black sooty smoke. The wood burns with a lighter colored smoke. And these chairs you're sitting on probably would burn the plastic. And we would do an inventory per square meter in how much material is there to burn. And we would look at cities and houses and factories and, and uh, schools. And, and you would calculate how much material. And then when it burned, maybe 3% would end up as smoke and to get an inventory of how much smoke. This is a drawing done of if there was a war in the Middle East, where how these smoke plumes would start. Unfortunately, we also have examples of nuclear weapons being dropped on cities. And there were, during the first nuclear war, the US dropped a bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 15 kiloton bomb. Kilotons is the equivalent. It's a 1,000 tons of TNT, trinitrotoluene, of explosive. So it's, it's the equivalent of 15,000 tons of explosive power. It killed about 150,000 people. And that's, the bombs are bigger now. They're 100, 450 kilotons, even a megaton. This is three millionths of the current world arsenal. Even though it's been reduced, this is three millionths of it. So just to give you an idea of how many weapons we still have, if you dropped one of these bombs starting that day, Every two hours, 12 a day, boom, boom, boom. Until today, you still couldn't use up the current nuclear arsenal. This is the plane that did it, the Enola Gay. It was named after the mother of Paul Tibbetts, the pilot. And this is in the uh, Smithsonian uh, Museum in Washington. This is a mock-up of the bomb. 
This is what one of the survivors remembers of Hiroshima. It was the fires, the fires and the smoke. And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. They cleaned up the streets. Where did all the buildings go? They went up in smoke. So unfortunately, we have these examples that cities do burn. There was another fire that was not caused on purpose. It was in 1906 in San Francisco. There was an earthquake. And it broke the, the uh, water mains, and the city burned for three days. Jack London was a famous American author. He, went, he was asked to write an article about it. So he wrote, within an hour after the earthquake shock, the smoke of San Francisco's burning was a lurid tower visible 100 miles away. And for three days and nights, this lurid tower swayed in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, and filling the land with smoke. I watched the vast conflagration from out on the bay. It was dead calm, not a flicker of wind stirred. Yet from every side, wind was pouring in upon the doomed city. East, west, north, and south, strong winds were blowing upon the doomed city. The heated air rising made an enormous suck. Thus did the fire of itself build its own colossal chimney through the atmosphere. Day and night, there was dead calm continued, yet near the flames, the wind was often half a gale, so mighty was the suck. So we know that you can get a firestorm. Once it started, it will burn, and if there's a wind, it will propagate through the city. This is what San Francisco looked like afterwards. This is one of the first aerial photographs. There were some uh, stone buildings, but all the other ones burned. This is a graph of the number of countries with nuclear weapons and time. So the US was the first, then the Soviet Union, UK, France, China. It's probably not a coincidence that these five countries are the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. And then uh, Israel, although they won't admit it, then India, then India helped South Africa build a bomb and they tested it in the atmosphere. Then South Africa gave up their nuclear weapon. Now the Southern Hemisphere has no nuclear weapons. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, three new countries had nuclear weapons, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. They gave them back to Russia. But then Pakistan, North Korea. And this, this slope is one new state every five years. Now, this is 2010. Now it's 2015, and there's still nine. So that's, that's good that it looks like it stopped going up. But now uh, there are nine countries. The first... Uh, calculation was done with by these people, Turco, Tune, Ackerman, Pollock, and Sagan. And uh, they uh, uh, ran a model, they published a paper in science called uh, Nuclear Winter. And this is called the TAPS paper, an acronym from their name. And it gave Nuclear Winter the name. And uh, they took 5,000 megatons of explosive power. That was their baseline case. That was one-third of the nuclear arsenal at the time between the U.S. and Russia. And they also did a city case, only 100 megatons. Uh, but this was the uh, equivalent of the... Uh, and this dot here is the uh, explosive power used in World War II, during which 50 million people died. So this is what they used then. And they calculated how the global temperature would change. And it would, it would cool and get below freezing. This is at 300 days with their model and stay below freezing for several months. And they calculated in altitude, this is 20 kilometers, it would heat the, the upper atmosphere and cool the surface. But they didn't know how long the smoke would last, so they had only had it last for a couple months. Now, Alexandrov and Stenchikov, two Russians, at the same time did an experiment with a, a general circulation model where they would calculate how the smoke would move around the world. And they published it in, in 1983 also. And this is the uh, atmosphere from the North Pole to the South Pole, upward motion, downward motion. Normally, you have the upward motion in the tropics, but they, the smoke would heat the uh, atmosphere and blow it into the Southern Hemisphere. And they found that this is how the temperature would change on day 40. It would cool 40 degrees below normal, 50, 50 degrees below normal in the, where the smoke would be. Now, I did a calculation with a uh, energy balance climate model. And I found that uh, the cooling would last for several years because of a snow albedo feedback. 
the uh, people at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Covey et al., used a more sophisticated general circulation model at NCAR, and they also found temperatures below freezing over land after 10 days. So this is the graphics that, that they had from their simulation. And that we didn't have color printers then. We didn't have PowerPoint. So they took, uh, they had, but they had a, a computer screen, and they drew the graph in color. They took a photograph with 35 millimeter film and made 35 millimeter slides out of it. That, and so this was where the smoke went into the atmosphere. And so this is the world you can see. Yes. Well, it's, this is in the United States, this is uh, Europe and, and Russia. So this is the place where the smoke would come. And it produced a total of 5,000 million uh, tons of smoke. And so if you look from the North Pole to the South Pole, this is the smoke. And after five days, and it starts to be heated by the sun and lofted up. To, and after uh, 20 days, it got to the Southern Hemisphere. Now, this model only went to 20 kilometers. They could only run it for 20 days. They used the Cray computer, which was the supercomputer at the time. But your, your iPhone is much more powerful than the computer that they used. So they, they could only uh, do it for 20 days, one run. They couldn't include the upper atmosphere or see where it went. We were able to do that more recently with modern computers. And this is where the smoke went after 20 days. And uh, this is the, the, the temperature. Uh, on day 20, this is the temperature change. So temperatures were between 15 and 25 degrees colder than normal over here, more 5 to 15 degrees colder than normal. And it turns out that we still get the same answer today. Uh, this was done 30 years ago. If you block out the sun, it's going to get cold, especially over the land. It's pretty simple. So I'm going to, uh, I thought I had. Uh, I'm going to st start here. So uh, how many nuclear weapons are there today? 16,400. And I'm going to, so these symbols are ballistic missiles uh, on the ground, ones that are deployed, including on submarines, carried by aircraft, and retired. Russia has about 8,000, the US about 7,000. China, 250, Pakistan, 100, France, 300, India, 100. Uh, North Korea, less than 10. UK, 225. Israel, maybe 100. Why do the US and Russia have so many weapons when every other country has a couple hundred? If you think nuclear weapons are going to deter an attack, how many do you need to threaten to put onto the capital of your enemy to stop them? One. Maybe you need two if the first one doesn't work. So 200. Or 300 is more than enough, but we still have thousands. So one thing the US and Russia could do today is to go down to 200, still maintain their deterrence, and uh, prevent nuclear winter. Now, we asked the question, what if India and Pakistan had a nuclear war? Imagine uh, along the uh, Kashmir border, some little skirmish escalating. And because of miscommunication or misunderstanding or panic, it started into a nuclear war. These are two nuclear states. So uh, Ruby and I were at a meeting uh, two years ago in Astana in Kazakhstan. And at the, uh, the, they gave you a newspaper every day. So I was there as an international physicians for prevention of nuclear war meeting. And there's a little article in that, in that uh, newspaper. Uh, Four people were killed when nuclear-armed rivals India and Pakistan traded fire with each other across the border, unprovoked military action. These things happen all the time. And we're really lucky that they don't go to more than this. But they're shooting at each other across the border. Uh, on one, uh, two Pakistani civilians were martyred by Indian fire, a senior mil Pakistani military official said. It's pretty scary. That's probably the place in the world where such a thing might be most likely to start. Now, the US was very proud that we killed Osama bin Laden several years ago. But imagine your Pakistani air defense, and somehow you can see these uh, airplanes coming in to attack you. Who, where did where'd you think that they came from? 
India. You wouldn't think that your ally, the United States, would be attacking you. Are we lucky that this also did not start a nuclear war? Everybody thinks it's in the United States it was wonderful that we did this, but I think we were lucky. <laughs> so we decided to calculate what would be the effects of climate if there was such a war. We calculated how much, and we thought maybe they have very small nuclear weapons, 15 kilotons, the same size as was dropped on Hiroshima. And we also know how much of an area that would burn. So we said if we dropped 50 weapons the size of Hiroshima onto Pakistan and 50 onto India, how much smoke would you get? And we did this for many countries. For India, you'd get 3.5 million tons of smoke. Pakistan, three million, so six and a half million. But uh, we decided to uh, uh, be conservative, so we took five million tons of smoke. We put it in the atmosphere over India and Pakistan to see what. what now this is compared to 150 million that we used for for the nuclear winter simulation. And it would be horrible. Twenty million people would die from the direct effects but five million tons of smoke would be injected into the atmosphere. So this is the climate model simulation I did. This is a map showing where the smoke is in the horizontal, and this is in the vertical. This is the tropopause, the boundary between the troposphere where, we, where rain occurs and the stratosphere where it doesn't. The smoke would be heated by the sun and lofted up into the stratosphere far above the tropopause. It would be very tiny soot particles. They would fall very slowly. It turns out another analog is volcanic eruptions. The lifetime for smoke is for particles is about a year. Here it would be six or seven years. And so we didn't know this until we did the simulation with a modern climate model that goes up to 80 kilometers, not to 20 kilometers. And we could run it for many years. So we plotted the temperature around the world, how it would change. This is the global warming we all know and love. And temperature would go rapidly, uh, and this would be, uh, it would be more than a degree colder. It would be the largest climate change in recorded human history. The period back here was called the Little Ice Age. It would get colder than that, but it wouldn't get below freezing, but it would still be a large temperature change. Now, that was one climate model, but two other climate modeling groups have recently done the same experiment and got basically the same answer. A group in Switzerland and a group in the United States all found the same thing. Global cooling for more than a decade, unprecedented recorded human history, from only 100 Hiroshima-sized bombs, much less than 1% of the global nuclear arsenal on the other side of the world. So uh, this is the simulation done at NCAR. He has fancier graphics. So this is the South Pole, the North Pole, and shows how the smoke would be heated to the top of the stratosphere. And this is in April. So this is now uh, summer in the Northern Hemisphere, and the sun is heating it, so it's being lofted higher in the Northern Hemisphere. And it only gets removed if it sinks into the troposphere, and then the rain washes it out. And then it would, uh, as it goes to Northern Hemisphere winter, Southern Hemisphere, summer, then it's lofted into the uh, up here. So what we did is then we compared these three models. This is the amount of smoke from our first simulation with the GIS model, the reduction of sunlight, global temperature reduction, global precipitation reduction. If you add the Swiss model, a lot of the smoke got washed out immediately, so they had less smoke and a little bit less, less sunlight, about the same cooling. And then the NCAR model, again, some got washed out. But this was a better model. It had much more higher resolution in the stratosphere. And it had ozone chemistry. And the smoke, by 10 years, there was more smoke. And the temperature change was lower. And it turns out uh, you also get, we ran it for 27 years, you also get cooling in the ocean by uh, more than almost a degree. Nobody's actually looked at the impacts on ocean biosphere. This is something else that would happen. Now, we also calculate you get heating in the stratosphere. And this is the normal amount of ozone from the South Pole to the North Pole. After a nuclear war, you would have ozone depletion. And this is the level we call an ozone hole. It gets below this in the spring. 
But now you have a global ozone hole with more ultraviolet reaching the surface. So typical ozone di distribution in October or the ozone hole now, it would spread around the world. Now, how would this affect health? The World Health Organization has a UV index which tells how dangerous ultraviolet radiation is. If it's less than 7, then protection is required in the middle of the day. But if it's up to 10, then it's dangerous. Don't go outside in the midday. Uh, and so we did a calculation of the UV index with our climate model. This is the current UV index in June and December. And this is in year 3, so it goes up to maybe 12 to 15. But after a nuclear war, it would get up to 18 or 20. And the difference would be three or four units of UV index. So UV, in spite of the fact that there's smoke there, the smoke would absorb some of the UV. In spite of that, there would be more UV reaching the surface, and it would be a terrible impact on, on life. What effect would it have? Well, for human health, uh, a fair-skinned North American would receive a painful sunburn after six minutes at noon. Increased skin cancer. For crops, there would, it would affect the, the crop growth the soil bacteria, genetic damage over generations, and plants would be more susceptible to attacks by insects. On the fisheries, it would affect phytoplankton, the plants that live at the surface, and decrease reproductive capacity. Nobody's actually calculated any of these effects. This is research waiting to be done. If anybody wants to do it, we'll give you the change of UV, and you can, you can apply that to your, your, your model of health, health impacts. We so far have only looked at the effects on on crops, but we haven't included the UV damage. But we're, we ha have a crop model now that includes uh, ozone damage, and we're about to, we're going to, over the next couple of years, we're going to, we're planning to do that, at least for, for agriculture. Also, the growing season would be shorter because there would be a frost later in the spring and a frost earlier in the fall, and so some crops might not grow, and the growing season would be 10, 20, 30 days shorter in the middle latitudes of both hemispheres. We calculate how this would affect agriculture. So the country that produces the most rice is China, the most wheat, China, the most corn, the United States, China is second. So we looked at the United States and China, and we published three papers on this. We looked at corn and soybeans in the Midwest in the United States, rice, maize, and wheat in China. These papers were published a couple years ago, uh, and one in 2015 where we used all three of the climate models and looked at Chinese agriculture. I'll just show you uh, a couple results. This is the impacts now with a new crop model of reduction of maize. So red is a reduction. This, the years keep changing after the nuclear war with a crop model at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, CLM crop. So there would be, and now we're, we're getting to the point where we can go to every country with every crop and say, no more coffee for you, no more chocolate for you, no more wine for you. And so it's not just what happens in U.S. and China, but what happens in each country. And we're, we're producing that so we can in better inform people and so they can feel. And this is a, remember, this is the effects of a very tiny nuclear war on the other side of the world using less than 1% of the nuclear arsenal. And so uh, to summarize, uh, for the first, and this doesn't even include damage from excess UV. In the first five years, a reduction of U.S., corn 20%, soybeans 15%, wheat in China by 40%. For the second five years, 10 to 20% reduction of crops. So China had, when China produced this much food, they had several hundred million fewer people. You can imagine what this would happen in the world. We have examples. In, in Russia five years ago, there was a a drought, they stopped exporting wheat, that started the Arab Spring. The price of food doubled in other countries. So if countries stopped exporting, uh, there would be food crisis around the world, and, it w and, and people that are living in a marginal existence would really have a problem. But it's much worse than that. It's much worse than that. This is a U.S. Trident nuclear submarine. It has 96 nuclear weapons. Each one a thousand, hundred or four hundred or five hundred kilotons. So each trident can produce the explosive power of a thousand Hiroshima's. Does the, everything I've set up till now was a hundred Hiroshima's. Each one of these can do a thousand Hiroshima's. The United States has fourteen of them, fourteen thousand Hiroshima's. 
The United States has the same explosive power on their missiles and, uh, and airplanes, so that's 28,000 Hiroshimas. And Russia has the same, 56,000 Hiroshimas. So we did a simulation. What would happen if we put a, a war between the U.S. and Russia? Where would the smoke go? It would be much, much thicker. Again, it would cover the world. And the temperature, this is in the first summer, Northern Hemisphere summer, temperature change, more than 30 degrees Celsius below normal, more than 20 degrees, 15 degrees Celsius below normal. Even over the ocean, you would have huge climate change. Even over Mexico, you would have 10 degrees below normal. So a lot of the world which wasn't involved in this, in this war would have huge impacts. And in the second year, uh, a year later, the, the effects would be even larger. So l let's take a place in the Ukraine where there's a lot of agriculture. This is the time series of the daily minimum temperature in this place. In the summer, it gets up to 20 degrees. In the winter, it gets below freezing. But after the nuclear war, which we assumed happened in May, temperatures would plummet below freezing and stay below freezing for at least a couple years. So obviously, no agriculture for years. Basically, there would be no food growing around the world for years. So you'd use up the food you had, and then everybody would starve to death. We looked at the global average temperature change. So this is the, what I showed you before for the India-Pakistan case. Temperatures would be about one and a half degrees colder. But they would, uh, we did 150 teragrams I just showed you. Temperatures would get seven or eight degrees colder. We also did an uh, example with a third the amount of smoke. And if you plot this on the global warming that we all know and love, this is what I showed you before. This is 50 teragrams. 150 teragrams. This is colder than the Little Ice Age. 20,000 years ago, there were ice sheets covering North America and Europe. Before you ask, yes, this would solve the global warming problem. I wrote a little essay called A Modest Proposal. I published it in the Huffington Post. Nuclear weapons are the solution to global warming. Uh, you can, uh, uh, so I did actually a climate model simulation. This is business as usual. Uh, 2,000, 2,100. This is after a nuclear war. It would get very cold, and then there would be no more CO2 produced, and you'd end up with pre-industrial temperatures. Problem solved. Now, this, I gave a talk about this yesterday. Called, it's called geoengineering. The idea is to not kill people, but put particles in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight to cool the Earth. It's also a, good, a bad idea, not as bad as this idea. But uh, So what's new? in this work, work we've done in the last 10 years. A nuclear war between any, any nuclear states using much less, it doesn't have to be India, Pakistan. It could be India got their weapons to protect themselves from China. Pakistan got theirs to protect themselves from India. Israel has their weapons. So uh, any two nuclear states using much less than 1% of the current ar arsenal would produce climate change unprecedented in recorded human history. Such a small nuclear war would reduce food production by 20 to 40% for a decade. The nuclear winter theory was correct. The current arsenal can still produce nuclear winter. The effects of regional or global nuclear war would last for more than a decade. How do we test this? As I said, I mentioned one or two of the analogs. We use other analogs to test it. So I'm going to talk, talk about analogs, then I'm going to talk about policy implications, what we can do about it. So the seasonal cycle. It gets cold in the winter. Why does it get cold? There's less sunlight. The days are shorter. The sun's at a lower angle. Nighttime. We all know it gets cold at night. Turn off the sun, it gets cold. We all have this intuitive feel for what happens. Firestorm cities burn. I showed that to you. And during World War II, there were firestorms started by conventional bombs in Tokyo, Dresden, Hamburg, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then the question is, would the smoke actually be transported around the world, and what would be the temperature effects because of the smoke? So I'll show you a couple of these analogs. Uh, Dresden was burned by the United States in firebombing. I took this picture of the Church of Our Lady. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut was a prisoner of war in the United States. He's a famous uh, science fiction writer in the United States. I don't know how many of you have heard of him. Uh, he wrote a book about it called Slaughterhouse-Five. And he described what happened to Billy Pilgrim. He was down in a meat locker 
and the night dress and was destroyed. A guard would go to the head of the stairs every so often to see what it was like outside. There would be come down and whisper to the other guards. There was a firestorm out there. Dresden was one big flame. The one flame made everything organic, everything that would burn. So you can see we have examples that, that firestorms are started even by conventional weapons. When a satellite went around Mars on the Martian Global Surveyor, it measured the amount of dust in the atmosphere. This is June 17th, 18th. There was a little dust storm that started in the southern hemisphere. Mars has an atmosphere, too. And it was heated by the sun, lofted, and blown into the other hemisphere. And after a couple of weeks, it covered the whole world. So we've actually observed what I just showed you in my climate model simulation. We've observed the same thing happening on Mars. So that, again, makes us, gives us more confidence that this theory, that the climate model simulations are correct. Now, uh, Jaime knows about this. Uh, uh, the, an asteroid uh, hit, hit Earth, uh, hit Mexico 65 million years ago. It's the beginning of the age of mammals. It killed everything bigger than, a, than a, something like this, and, and the warm-blooded animals survived, and it killed the dinosaurs. That was huge climate change, and we think it was mostly by, by particles of dust lofted in the atmosphere, but also there were hot rocks that went around the world and start, started fires everywhere. And there was a lot of smoke from the fires. And so there's a layer of soot along with the other iridium and other things. So, so it was a massive catastrophe. But this was not caused by humans. A nuclear war would be caused by humans. So we can prevent that. We can't prevent this, and unless you believe Bruce Willis movies. Uh, <laughs> but it's an example of a huge climate change caused by particles in the atmosphere. Now, in Yellowstone, I took this picture in Yellowstone National Park. And in Wyoming, there was a fire uh, 20 years earlier, and I did a study. This is uh, the United States. So this is Mexico. This is Texas. This is Wyoming. And this is the smoke blowing out here. This was September 7th, 1988. And it came over the Midwest US. And I calculated how much cooling you would get, and up to 5 or 6 degrees Celsius colder in the daytime because of the smoke in the atmosphere. This was in the troposphere. It wasn't as black, sooty smoke as from a burning plastics, but still. We can measure in the atmosphere that much cooling because of smoke in the atmosphere. Now, we also know that if there's a big enough fire, you can, it can produce what we call pyrocumulonimbus. So it can produce a thunderstorm caused by the fire, and it can pump soot actually up into the stratosphere. So Mike Fromm and others have actually measured uh, soot with satellite in the stratospheres, pumped up from a, a big forest fire in Canada and one in Australia. Now, uh, Edward Monk painted this, uh, the, the, this picture 10 years after the Krakatoa eruption because he remembered uh, this fabulous sunset caused by the volcano. And this is sort of how I feel about nuclear winter. Uh, this reminds me to talk about volcanoes. So in Mexico here in 1982, this was the El Chichon volcano, Chichonal. And this is what it looked like before the eruption. There's the old crater, the lava dome. They were far farming around it. It erupted in April 4th, 1982, with no warning because there were no geophysicists there monitoring it at the time. And this is what it looked like afterwards. And uh, we looked at satellite images and looked at where the ash went. So this was on uh, April 5th, 6th, 7th each day. This is uh, North America, Asia. This is Hawaii. and so. In one week, we could see it got most of the way across the Pacific. And in two weeks, it went to India. And in three weeks, it went around the world. And so using this Mexican volcanic eruption as an example, we can see that particles that go in the stratosphere can actually travel around the world large distances. And actually, we measured sulfur from this in the ice cores in Greenland. And so it, went, it actually covered the whole world. The Lockheed volcano erupted for eight months. Uh, in uh, 1783. And I took this picture standing on top of the mountain, this crack open, spewing out. It was about 10 El Chichon eruptions during this eight months, that much, that much sulfur. And it caused climate change. If you were, were here yesterday, uh, you heard me talk about this. There was a rich French guy, the Comte de Volney, lived in Cairo, was in Cairo. He wrote, the inundation of 1783 was not sufficient. So what happened was the Nile River there was a less precipitation also. And the Nile River didn't flow, didn't normally. Normally, it would overflow its banks, giving water and nutrients for agriculture. And that was the Egyptian annual cycle. In 1784, again, it didn't happen. And there was famine and mass migration of people 
from Egypt because of the climatic effects of a volcanic eruption. So this, again, is what you might expect if, if humans cause this large climate change. And there was famine in India and China and Japan in 1783, too, caused by the particles from a, a big volcanic eruption. In 1815, the Tambora volcano erupted in Indonesia. It was 201 years ago. We had a nice big conference on this last year on the 20th anniversary. And it produced the year without a summer in 1816, when their temperatures got below freezing every summer month in New England in the United States. And it caused a mass migration of, again, mass migration of people out west over the Appalachian Mountains. So climate change can produce climate refugees. And we're seeing the, and that's a big, threat about global warming, too. Percy Bysshe Shelley, the famous British poet, his wife Mary, and their friend Lord Byron were having their vacation in Geneva that summer in 1816. And they were going to go hiking and boating. But it was cold and gloomy and wet in Europe, too, because of the effects of this volcanic eruption. They said, well, OK, we're writers. Let's have a contest to see who can write the scariest ghost story. And Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, inspired by the climatic effects of a volcanic eruption. And, it, and uh, the, the, at the beginning of the book, the monster is climbing over the ice. And at the end, the monster is climbing over the ice uh, because of the, the, what was happening outside. It, it even produced a postage in the United States. So, so this is the, uh, I took this picture. This is Geneva. This is Jetto. So that wasn't there. But this is the building they lived in. Uh, and there's a plaque on the side, Lord Byron. Uh, English poet, wrote The Prisoner of Chillon when he lived here in 1816. But they also, uh, and, and uh, uh, Shelley's lived down the hill. So, uh, so this is uh, what they produce, uh, again, a scary image. Another friend of theirs was John William Polidori, and he wrote The Vampire. So the vampire also was caused by a volcanic eruption. Uh, it was written in 1816, published in 1819. But first on earth as vampires sent, thy corpse shall from its tomb be rent, then ghastly haunt the native place and suck the blood of all thy race. There from my daughter, sister, wife, and midnight drain the stream of life. Yet loath the banquet which perforce must feed by thy livid living corpse, thy victims, ere they yet expire, shall know the demon for their sire. So they would like take women and, and bite them and suck the blood out of them. And then at the end, uh, the guardians hastened to protect Miss Aubrey, but when they arrived, it was too late. Lord Ruthven had disappeared, and Aubrey's sister had glutted the thirst of a vampire. So, uh, now, uh, it's often thought that Byron was the model for the vampire. He was known as a womanizer. So, uh, Now, Byron didn't write a, uh, a, a, a book, but he also wrote a poem. And it was called Darkness. And I learned about it from Russian scientists in the 1980s when we were doing research on nuclear winter. And they saw it in a translation by Turgenev. I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished. And the stars did wander darkly in, in the eternal space, rayless and pathless. And the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. And morn came and went and came and brought no day. And men forgot their passion in the dread of this their desolation. And all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. And they did live by watchfires in the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons. Cities were consumed. So it wasn't really that bad. It was about a degree colder. So this was a poetic license. But it sounds just like nuclear winter. It's amazing. Now, I'm finally going to finish talking about policy impacts. Uh, President Obama and President Medvedev signed the New START Treaty in 2010 in Prague. And it, it pledged, uh, it's called the New START Treaty, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. It pledged within seven years for each side to reduce their warheads to the maximum of 1,550 per side. But each, each, each airplane counts for one weapon, because you don't know how many weapons are on it. So maybe they'll each have 2,000 weapons. 4,000 nuclear weapons. But that's enough to produce a nuclear winter. The scenario I showed you of 150 million tons could be produced by this many weapons. And we said, how, how is it possible? We have about 6% of the, of the arsenal as what we had in the 1980s. Well, it turns out to the scenario we had for 150 nuclear weapons, 
uh, 150 million tons before, a third of the arsenal. We looked at what the targets were. You asked what the targets were. We asked, looked at all the targets. Every place that would burn in, in Russia and the U.S. was bombed. And they saw this huge pile of weapons. Now let's put two on in case one misses. Still this huge pile of weapons. So it turned out they were putting nine weapons on every target using a third of the arsenal back then. So we just put one, we bouncing the rubble. We just put one weapon on each target, and you could still today have enough nuclear weapons to produce the same amount of smoke. Just isn't enough stuff to burn. That's what we learned with our climate modeling. So what are the policy implications? If Russia and the U.S. immediately reduced their arsenals down to 200 weapons, that would prevent nuclear winter, because you wouldn't get enough cooling to make it below freezing. It would still be terrible, but it wouldn't be nuclear weapon, nuclear winter. But to produce, reduce the possibility of, get, of nuclear winter, you have to, a nuclear famine, you'd have to have nuclear abolition, get rid of the weapons. Because they can be used by accident. I think the most likely scenario is they're used by accident, by some teenage hacker or some, some uh, military, somebody going crazy or somebody, uh, computer problem, rather than on purpose. So Carl Sagan was a great hero of mine. He worked on this in the 1980s. He said, for myself, I would far rather have a world in which the climatic catastrophe cannot happen, independent of the vicissitudes of leaders, institutions, and machines. This seems to me to be elementary planetary hygiene, as well as elementary patriotism. So I agree. I think elementary planetary hygiene demands that we eliminate the weapons much faster than they're being eliminated today. So how do you feel? I took this picture at a Bob Dylan concert, uh, my favorite artist. I'm sorry if you really feel bad. I'm sorry. Uh, it's been a bummer. Uh, uh, it's really depressing. It's really not nice of me to tell you this depressing story. And how do you react to this now? What are you going to do? As Mark Twain, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. So people, it, it, it will feel better for you if you pretend you didn't hear this, you walk out the door and pretend it doesn't exist, and you get on with your life, and your life will be better. That's a normal human reaction to this. And I won't, I'll understand if that's what you do. My reaction has been different. My reaction is, let me try to change it. Let me try to change it, rather than let me try and forget it. And I've had two cases in my life where I've been part of a movement that actually changed things. In the 1970s, 60s, when I was in college, they wanted me to go to Vietnam and kill people. There was a military draft. And I said, that's wrong. I don't want to participate. And I lied on my physical exam and didn't do it. I was in the Peace Corps instead. I went to the Philippines and taught teachers how to teach meteorology for two years. Did much more for my planet. And in the 1980s, I was part of the scientists that helped uh, do nuclear winter, and we saw that that ended the arms race. That feel, felt like, you know, these things are impossible. Stopping a war, stopping the arms race, but we did it. So let's try and do this. So it's sort of my mission in life to try and, and uh, get rid of nuclear weapons. So uh, it turns out that biological weapons have been banned by international treaty. Chemical weapons have been banned. Landmines have been banned. Cluster munitions have been banned, but nuclear weapons, the worst weapon of mass destruction of all, has not been banned. So that's, that's next. So this is a group called ICANN, International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. It grew out of IPPNW. And so there's their website. Uh, Al Gore won the Nobel Peace Prize along with the IPCC for doing studying global warming. He said, more than two decades ago, scientists calculated that nuclear war could throw up so much debris and smoke that it would block life-giving sunlight from atmosphere, causing a nuclear winter. Their eloquent warnings here in Oslo helped galvanize the world's resolve to halt the nuclear arms race. So this was his nuclear Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech. So Brian Toon and I are working. We're, we're still trying to do this. We wrote an article, Scientific American. Uh, we wrote this article, Self-Assured Destruction, the Climatic effect, Impacts of Nuclear War. It turns out. Everybody thinks it's mutual assured destruction. I'm not going to attack you because you're going to attack me and we'll all die. But now, based on our climate model results, it's actually, if we attack, if, if one country attacks another country and the other country doesn't do anything, all that smoke will cause everybody in the first country to die. So if you say, I am keeping my nuclear weapons to deter nuclear war, you're acting like a suicide bomber. 
And this is the reality, and we're trying to get people to, p to pay attention to this reality. I was a lead author of the IPCC report, the most recent one. I was on Chapter 8 of Radio Forcing with Blanca Mendoza, who was, came to my talk here yesterday for, from UNAM. And I was able to put a, a paragraph into the IPCC report for the first time on nuclear winter. So that was a, a minor victory. I don't know if anybody read it, but now it's, uh, uh, it's in there. Uh, now, you in Mexico should be proud of your, your work because the Treaty of, I can't pronounce this right, the Treaty of Tlatelolco was, uh, was uh, signed in 1967, which committed all of Latin America and the Caribbean to not have nuclear weapons. And Al Alfonso Garcia Robles from Mexico won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1982 for this work. So, that's, that, so you guys can't uh, go demand your government change because your government already gets it. You're already anti-nuclear. Uh, the, this little map here shows the countries without nuclear weapons. And so this is the equator here. The entire southern hemisphere has no nuclear weapons. Uh, all of Africa and South America and these, uh, Mongolia and these countries here in Eastern Europe, uh, parts of Southeast Asia. There are nine countries with nuclear weapons. There's one in the western hemisphere, my evil country. There's two in Europe, uh, England and France, and there's six in Asia. India, China, Israel, you can hardly see it here, uh, Russia, North Korea. So it's only, this is a simpler problem to solve than global warming. You only have to get nine countries to change things, and it's not as much money involved uh, as changing the entire energy structure of the planet. So uh, there have been three meetings on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear war. Uh, one, the first one was in Norway. The second one was here in Mexico. That was my last trip to Mexico two years ago. It was in Nayarit, and there's a picture of me in a in a my, in a suit. And I went to this conference, and it was hosted by Mexico. 146 nations and and uh, civil society came. And after the third one, which was in Austria, then uh, there's this process called the open-ended working group, which has started meeting. Uh, this is in 2016, so the, they had their first meeting just uh, a couple weeks ago, and this is an uh, ongoing process now in the United Nations, again, to try and inform the countries with the nuclear weapons to get them involved to try and push them to, to get rid of nuclear weapons, and Mexico is, is, is sponsoring this. I started, so uh, the kids tell me I should get involved in social media. That's the way to change the world. So I started blogging. I have a Huffington Post blog. I, do, I did a TED Talk. Uh, about this. Uh, I started Twitter, so I have a Twitter account. I only, I only tweet about nuclear issues. I don't tweet about what I had for breakfast. Uh, <laughs> now, this picture is a picture I took in, uh, in Cuba next to the, weather, the Meteorological Institute. It's a gift from the Russia, a model of one of the 36 nuclear uh, missiles they had in Cuba during the, before the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, I, uh, Brian and I were successfully had an op-ed in the New York Times just uh, it's February 11th, so less than a month ago. We had an op-ed in the New York Times. Uh, let's end the peril of nuclear winter. And so we've been pushing to do that. We finally got that. That uh, I'm nobody. Obama did not call me up. I read your op-ed. I'm going to change. Not yet, but we're trying to do it in all ways to inform people. Now this is that rocket I showed. This is the the plaque on the side. Uh, the power of the low was one megaton, so that's 77 times as powerful as, as Hiroshima. There were three me regiments with a total of 36 nuclear weapons in, uh, aimed at the United States, and we were very lucky to have avoided a nuclear war at the time. Now, uh, I got this very strange email from my former Cuban student, Juan Carlos Antonio. He said, the Cubans want you to come down here and talk about climate change, and it turned out Fidel fell down and broke his uh, shoulder and leg, and then he got probably uh, uh, intestinal cancer, and, and he got very sick and gave up control of the government to his brother Raul. And then he got better, and he had nothing to do, and he had sp sp spare time. So he, somehow he discovered my work, and they invited me down there, and I gave a talk in front of 150 people, and he sat at the front and listened for, for uh, an hour, and then they took this picture, and he autographed it and gave it to me. Fidel Castro, September 10th, 2010. And uh, then he gave me his autobiography to practice my Spanish. 
Uh, and that's Betty Munoz, the translator. And, uh, and then in his blog, uh, a week later, he said, while the United States and Russia each committed to reduce their nuclear arsenals down to some 2,000 weapons in Prague, the only way to prevent a global climate catastrophe would be by eliminating nuclear weapons. So he got it. He basically, that's probably plagiarism, but it's okay with me. That's what, exactly what I said in my talk. Uh, uh, that's fine. He got it. But unfortunately, he doesn't have, well, maybe fortunately, he doesn't have any nuclear weapons to get rid of. It's the nine countries that still have them. So uh, I've been criticized on my, on my web page. I have a picture of me and Fidel, and I've been criticized. How can you be friends with such an evil person? And I tell people, well, you know, we're, we agree on this, so, so uh, I'm going to, uh, only talk about this, and so uh, they they gave me a. Uh, they Fidel said, "Do you mind if we videotape you?" And no, so they filmed me, and they showed it on nationwide television in prime time the next day. And I was getting a private tour around Havana, so we went to a hotel. I said, "Let's see if I'm on TV." And so I, I uh, went in, and there was a Julia Roberts movie on. I said, "Can you please change the channel?" And they changed out. There I was giving my talk, and so. What that taught me is the way to do this, the way to get the people of the world to know about it, is not a professor giving a lecture, but it's a Julia Roberts movie. So we need to get a feature film. You can imagine the beautiful Russian scientists and the American scientists fall in love, and meanwhile on the Kashmiri border, and they're trying to. So uh, it would make a great feature film, has some sex and some uh, drama in it. And so, but I, if anybody knows any screenwriters to do that, uh, the, that's the way to really inform the people, not me giving a TED Talk. Uh, so, but anyway, now at least you all know about this. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to end with this uh, quote from Dr. Seuss. Uh, Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. So I hope our planet ends up looking like this for a long time to come. Thanks. Thank you very much.